713 the Eastern Caribbean, no time for the Munster Volcano Observatory Report. You're tuned to the best radio on Montserrat, ZJB Radio. The level of alert is orange. At around 5.30 this morning, a large paraplastic flow swept down the Tyber Valley and the large amount of material reached the sea. Anyone entering this area risks death. A major collapse of the dome is possible and could result in another violent explosion similar to that of September 1996. This concludes your Montserrat Volcano Report. Up next, we'll bring to you the death announcements. Uh, yeah, observatory. Um, Mike, Sierra and myself are both noting pyroclastic flows and this one still seems to be going over. Well, it's, um, it's at 500 degrees centigrade plus. It moves very quickly, um, 50 or 70 kilometres an hour minimum. Um, so you can't outrun it um, and it, it kills you if it touches you. So uh, that's, that's why it's dangerous. Essentially, it's, a, it's, a, it's controlled by density and you could say it's... It's like a snow avalanche, the same mechanics, except that uh, hell of a lot hotter and, uh, and carries big blocks. So it's... Mike Sierra, Sierra One. Mark, could you give us a report how far that one went, went please, over? Pyroclastic flows are majestic, beautiful to look at, but in reality, they're sinister. They really are one of the killers on a volcano. And when it's coming towards you, it's traveling at very high speeds, far faster than anyone can ever outrun or even outdrive in a car. It's very, very hot, so basically, if you get caught in one, you don't know whether you're going to fry first, whether you're going to get crushed, or whether you're just going to suffocate because it's a, just a dense mass, if you like, of, of ash. I have some goats, baby goats and baby sheep. They're up in the hills there, and right now the ash is trying to offend them. So I'm wondering from you what is best for them. Yeah, yeah. No, you. I mean, they only got tiny little lungs, huh? And yes. uh, if they start breathing in that ash, yeah. I'd be careful. Huh? So okay. I'd bring them down. Bring them down a bit if you can. Just... Well, I'm trying to bring them down a yeah. bit. Yeah. 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 So, how you all inspired to come down here to look about the volcano? What well. Was your... Job. It's our job. We come and uh, help out people who've got troubles with their volcano. So, you know, try and tell people, yeah, what what could the dangers of it really? Because yeah, it can be pretty dangerous, yeah. This thing is keep going on, going on, going. Yeah. Sometimes I get fed up myself about life, too, you know. Yeah. It's just yeah. I have to keep calm. Got him, mate. Got him. I'm telling you. Mm. When the volcano on Montserrat first erupted 18 months ago, it turned life on this tiny Caribbean island into a nightmare. Scientists are monitoring the volcano in the hope that they can give the people of this British colony a few hours warning before the volcano explodes again. It is, yeah, it is the most dangerous volcano in the world. It's just a unique situation where you've got a, a volcano which dominates the half of a, an island, half of a country, in fact. This volcano is unpredictable and it has the potential to explode. The eruption of Mont Pelé in 1902 was very similar to, to this current eruption. There were nearly 30,000 people killed. The south of the island has been evacuated. The capital city of Plymouth lies almost deserted and covered with ash. But on an island less than 10 miles long, there is nowhere to run to. A major explosive eruption could destroy the lives of the 7,000 people who still live here. When I was 15, I was watching um, the news and there was an eruption in Colombia in 1985. Tens of thousands of people were killed in it. I couldn't quite understand why these people were dying. I guess at the time I wanted to go around with a big S on my chest and uh, you know, save the world from all these natural disasters. My job and the job of a whole host of other scientists here is that um, we have to make uh, many different types of measurements to come up with some sort of scenario as to what the volcano will do. 
our prime objective is that no one dies whatsoever. So we make the measurements, we come up with a scenario, we tell the government, and in the event of a major eruption, uh, we must ensure that everyone who lives around the volcano is far enough away from it. What we're looking at here is, is the Sufria Hills volcano. And basically what it is, is, is this big scooped valley. And part of this valley is what we call English's Crater. And that's that big amphitheater. Sitting within, within the amphitheater is the present active dome. And basically what happens is, is that the, the magma is pushed up from below and it comes out, it's, it's exceptionally viscous and it just fills up and up and up forming this big dome structure. Um, it's exceptionally hot, um, very unstable, and these blocks that are overhanging is what usually falls off, generates the rock avalanches, and then the pyroclastic flows. It's a bit nervous, um, often singes your legs, you can, you can do baked potatoes as well if you want. Um, this, this structure here is um, what's left of a very ancient dome that was sitting in uh, English's crater before this eruption occurred. It's called Castle Peak and he's hanging on by the skin of his teeth at the moment. I've tried to be uh, a rolled up sleeves governor. I like to be amongst the people and I think during this ongoing crisis that's uh, the type of role that the people of Montserrat want, somebody they think they know, somebody they can approach. And when the governor gets on the radio at two in the morning to say it's time to go, um, I believe that they, they will heed that advice. The problem with Montserrat is the volcano is right in the centre of um, our most populated area and most of our infrastructure. The capital is to the west, and a third of the islanders normally live here. Further north of the island, the, the reason we are able to keep people on the island because the scientists reassure us that the northern part of the island, uh, really above this sort of line, uh, would be safe from um, everything except uh, the real worst case scenario. It's really progressively moving people uh, further up the island, the, the more active the volcano becomes. Um, we've declared these danger zones, there are curfews at night and people should not be there. But from time to time people um, come back from the north of the island where um, conditions are not as good as in the south. Things can be uncomfortable. Some people have been living in shelters now which are church haunts basically for uh, over a year. It was literally a dream house, it was a magic place. 
we uh, it was so beautifully peaceful and quiet all the time. Well, it, it was an enormous shock, I have to say, because volcanoes happen to other people; they don't happen to you. But it's it's a mess and it's sad. Uh... Have a good day. Yeah. Checkpoints are manned 24 hours a day. Only the scientists are routinely allowed into the unsafe zone. Most of the island's food came from the south's fertile volcanic soil. It's now covered in thick ash. Montserratians face a tough choice, risking their lives by trying to hang on in the unsafe zone or living in shelters in the north, or even leaving the island altogether. Nearly 4,000 have left since the crisis began. That's one of those things, a volcano is, uh, has no discrimination whatsoever. It doesn't matter who you are, what you are, what animal, what plant. You know, the volcano affects everyone and anything. It's, uh, it's pretty sad, really. And for example, this, this, house, this house is getting completely buried, you know? Look. It's just one complete sad story, if you like. We often uh, sort of feed these dogs and other animals because um, you can imagine that the owners have to leave the unsafe zone, so uh, they can't take the pets with them, obviously, into the shelters in the north, so, uh, so we feed them uh, house sandwiches. It, it doesn't really go with the, uh, the image of uh, a rough volcanologist, but <laughs> there you go. Uh. You give them yours, anyway. Where I am now, I'm about one mile and a quarter from the volcano. So the volcano is there doing its thing, and I'm its own thing. I'm here doing my own thing. The way I feel, I'm in front of it, and whenever I see anything, I move and come back. I visit Mr. Volcano on a daily basis, because that's the only place I have to survive. I have no other means to survive, so I have to be there. Not because I want to be there, I have to be there. Not because I don't know the danger, I know, but I just have to be there. Whenever we come to the checkpoint, we've been getting harassed by the police not to go home to our farm or to look for our animals. And if we had followed the restrictions that are set before us, our animals would have been already died we ourselves would not be ready to die for food. So we have to stay here? Well, I'll stay here. And I'll die here. Stay here. Die here. What the scientists fear most is that a large part of the volcano's dome will fall away. This would expose the huge reservoir of red hot gas filled magma, molten rock, that's just beneath the surface. When this magma is exposed to air, it explodes. This could happen at any time, unleashing a blast equivalent to an atomic bomb. See, they don't make them for, you know, big people, these things. You know, if I get hit by a pyroclastic flow, I'll get burnt ankles, like, you know. They won't actually protect you from, the, from really heat, but they won't burst into flames, basically, and that's, which is what normal clothes do. Most people who die on the edge of pyroclastic flows die of uh, skin burns. Or a lot of people do. Um, and you cut your skin burns down from 75% to 10% or 5%, then uh, your chances of survival go through the roof. So everything's protected, about, apart from the face, which isn't such a bad thing in Simon's case. <laughs> a bit of plastic surgery on him would be all right. 
Yeah. Well, I, don't, I mean, I got and my hands are free. Like. Yeah, but We've recently cool. observed cracks opening up uh, on part of the mountain called Galway's Wall, which um, contains the dome, holds the dome in place. One of the most important or vital measurements we're making at the moment is um, how fast these cracks are widening. Go ahead. OK, Angus, myself, Sierra One, are about uh, putting the station above uh, Farrell's target. What's the seismicity like? What we're afraid of is that if these cracks continue to widen, we might get a complete uh, collapse of the wall. That's the worst-case scenario. If that did happen, then it'll explode hot, pressurised material behind the wall, and we could get an explosion far bigger than we've seen on Montserrat as yet. Thank you very much, Angus, for that descriptive uh, opinion there. And um, we got our naughty suits on and uh, appreciate the surveillance. Over. When the mist is in, um, you're up there. You can't see much further than about 20 feet in front of you. So you get a false sense of security. There is a slight feeling of nervousness, but there is what I would call an adrenaline rush. You get in, you make your measurements. It's a calculated risk. We know the dangers involved, and at this present moment in time, I, I feel that I'm quite safe measuring those cracks. way of describing what we do in, in simple terms is something that a young kid once said to me. I explained to him what, what I was doing he turned around and, and said, OK, I understand now. You go in and, and take a, the dragon's pulse. I think that's the, one way of summing up what we do. You see that dome in front of you and you can feel the heat from the dome itself, then it, it really does go through your mind that, you, you know, you are trying to measure all over a, a, a potential killer, if you like. There's always an element of, of danger. There's always an element of something going on. And uh, for me, what, what, what goes through my mind is like, if my mother or my grandmother actually saw the, what I was doing now, then uh, I think uh, there's no way uh, next time I visit my parents that uh, they let me back out. This is the, the operation centre for the Volcano Observatory. It's monitoring the whole of the volcano. It's, it's a, um, an early warning system, if you like. We have points all, over, all around the volcano, and so if the, if the ground's moving, then um, the information that those, those, those machines gather out on, on the volcano is sent back here, and it's recorded on, on these pens, so it's a visual way of, of, of determining how much motion is occurring. Um, this evening, things are pretty quiet. Um, but, for example, um, this, uh, 
this trace here, th this is a pyroclastic flow. It only lasted for about two minutes, but during that two minutes, you're thinking to yourself, well, do I pick up the phone? Do I get the chief scientist out? Does he then get the governor out of bed? Will it end? Won't it end? Um, so it's a difficult call to make, but at, at the end of the day, our, our business is to make sure that everyone's safe and, and, and there's no fatalities. So it's always best. I quite, like, I quite enjoy getting the governor out of bed, actually. <laughs> so, but there we are. That's another story. <laughs> Observatory mic out the radio check, over. I got two people from Buckingham Palace waiting for dinner. I mean, I, I can give you 30 seconds, 60 seconds. <laughs> We got a, I got a phone call from the scientists about uh, 20 minutes ago to say that activity had picked up. Um, I said just to keep me in touch, but uh, within 10 minutes they phoned back to say that it was quite a large pyroclastic flow um, material um, going up to 15,000 feet. Stay over that Okay, good morning, gentlemen. Um, we had quite a busy day <coughs> yesterday, and uh, the Chief Minister and I went down with the scientists. I wanted to get you all out of bed, but uh, the Chief Minister persuaded me you needed your feet to sleep. So, as always, can we ask you, Simon, to give us a briefing on what happened yesterday and what you think is going to happen today and tomorrow? Yes, thanks, H.E. Um, yesterday we had... Um, a fairly substantial um, collapse. That was quite a surprise how quickly things built up yesterday, I think. Well, as governor, one's always got worries. The worries are almost entirely about the people of Montserrat. There's the constant worry that the volcano may do something the scientists have not predicted. Uh, this is the, the main phase of the pyroclastic flows, which lasted about 45, 50 minutes. We've got the dome at its largest size, around about 30 million cubic metres. And basically, we're at a phase now where we're not getting much warning before events. More likely collapses. We are now at perhaps the most dangerous period. So for the moment, uh, that um, crisis is over, and we now wait you know, for the next piece to fall off the volcano. For 18 months, that's been the pattern. An eruption, fear of a major explosion, followed by a sudden drop in activity and a return to an uneasy calm. I host a television program here in the Caribbean called Caribbean Crossroads, and I happen to have a camera in my possession when this thing began.
to me, videoing the volcano is like hunting elephants. Uh, you know, you go out and sometimes you don't get anything. But you're waiting for that one time when you catch an event that uh, would be just something that very few people have ever seen, let alone recorded on video. And so when that happens and you get a, a massive pyroclastic flow rushing down to the sea or something like that, you really return home feeling like you've really bagged the elephant this time, you know. But I guess in that too you'd have to be careful because uh, one day, you know, that there is the potential of the elephant getting you, you know. We're standing in front of the Delta, which is the new part of Montserrat, and it's been built by material flowing down the Tar River Valley from the volcano, hot blowing material, and actually rushing out into the sea, which is about 200 feet deep there, and building up to where it has formed a Delta, a new part of Montserrat. If you'd have been here yesterday morning, you'd have seen one of the most spectacular sights that you could ever see, which is a pyroclastic flow coming from the volcano and going out over the sea. And it was nine million cubic meters of hot glowing material, and that's a lot of hot rocks. arrived on the scene about 45 minutes to an hour late, there was still tremendous amount of steam and fountaining, which is when hot boulders go into the sea and cause the sea to boil and erupt up four or five feet. It was very spectacular. After last night's eruption, the scientific team need to find out what might happen next. To do this, they have to visit the delta formed by the volcano. Since summer 1996, the volcano has been producing 10 cubic meters of magma every second. The delta is the final resting place for most of this material. By taking rock samples and temperature measurements, they try to work out when the mountain will blow again. Observatory Sierra 1. Sierra 1, Observatory. Yeah, David, we're on the Delta, the helicopter's running. Uh, we're just doing some sampling and some uh, temperature measurements. Give us a shout if uh, seismicity picks up over. Good, uh, we'll do. And this is a digital thermometer, basically, and so we're going to test the temperature of the pyroclastic flows. So I'm just going to venture in here a little bit. See a little fumarole here. And that's just seawater feeding up underneath the deposits, seawater feeding up underneath us and then just being boiled off, essentially. So that'll only be at 100 degrees, just about. Temperature is at uh, 320 degrees Celsius just at the moment. And that's at a depth of um, about 30 centimetres. That's as far as I can get it down at the moment. Even down at the water's edge, yesterday's pyroclastic flows still have enough heat in them to cause major devastation. Analysis of the gas content of the rock samples confirms that the magma being pushed up is still very volatile and could explode when exposed to the air by rock falls. We're in a limbo period at present. There's a great dilemma about how much infrastructure we should start in the northern part of the island. The majority of Montserratians have exhausted their life savings and they're hanging on. The people who own homes, they pay mortgages 
on houses in the south of the island. For them, it's a very difficult decision should they start to build afresh in the, in the north of the island. None of us know. The crisis has meant onerous responsibility, which I don't suppose anybody would willingly take on, but that's the lot of a governor. There are decisions to be taken, very difficult decisions to be taken at times. And we, the only way is to, is to hang in, to work with the scientists, and pray, keep our fingers crossed, that uh, the volcano is not going to be too um, unkind to Montserrat. This is a cunning volcano, I mean, it really is crafty. Just when we think that, you know, we understand in some part of it, it'll change its, its activity, its the, the way it works, and present us with more problems. Volcanoes are, are bigger than us. There's no way we can stop them. And we can predict to a certain degree, but nature is, is more powerful than anything we, we can do. Volcanology is, is a relatively new science, and even the scientists here, I don't think there's one that won't say to you that they're basically here to monitor the volcano and hope that by monitoring it long enough that they would get to know how it reacts, what it does, and most of the time be able to tell you a little bit of a hint what might happen. If I'm going to be around the mountain, I pray, you know, and say, God, if I, if I'm, I shouldn't be here, you know, give me some kind of a feeling in my spirit you know, that it's time to move. And I would put more trust in that in the final word than any other, um, anything anybody else had to say. So there is something about it. There is a personality to the mountain and you, you have a deep respect for it and a reverence and sometimes fear <laughs> when running away from it, when it's blowing up. Don't do this at home. It's right in here, you start to hear it and it makes your heart beat real fast. And essentially, anybody watching, don't be stupid enough to come up here. It's my last trip, and it's hot already, and it's spewing right now. There's an eruption right now on Langs. I'm not gonna stay long. What you hear there is rocks coming up and I'm getting out of here. The whole mountain's shaking, I'm out of here. And you can hear stuff dropping. Hit the whole mountain shaking harder and harder. So I'm getting out of here. She's blowing hot and heavy behind me. But the thing about it is you gotta pace yourself. If you go too fast, you collapse. Well, that's what you call in your face. Do I look scared? <laughs> Let me take it and put it on auto. Now do I look scared? I'm not out of here yet. I'm only down about 600 feet. If the whole thing went, wouldn't have a chance up here. I think that's the closest I ever thought about being dead. Last couple of days activity has been increasing so it's important that we get out and measure gas levels coming from the volcano. Mark Billy. Mark him. Check. We're very level. We're starting to go down slightly. Okay. Mark. Mark. The co-spec measures the gas that's coming out of the volcano up. and it's a very easy uh, technique that measures a part of the spectrum that we can't see and we were able to point that up into the gas cloud and by doing a series of calculations, it can tell us how many tonnes per day of gas is coming from the summit of the volcano. The important thing about measuring the sulphur is that um, it gives us a handle on how much gas is in the magma and the volcano. 
<clears throat> and that's, that's quite important because um, if there's more gas, which is more volatiles in the magma, the potentially more explosive that magma could be. It's just like a, a Coke bottle with, with lots of gas in it. You give it a shake, the gas isn't allowed to escape. As soon as you open the top of the Coke bottle, out comes the Coke, and that's essentially what's what would happen. If the gas can't escape, then there'll be a, an eruption. Yes, can we help you, sir? Yeah, I'd like to go in and do some videotaping of the volcano. It's a very dangerous area. You must okay. not go there. Nobody okay. must go there. Okay. okay? I understand. And in the future, don't come back here with that kind of thing. All right, I'll talk, talk to, to you like Keep it as a souvenir. <laughs> I mean, I guess they got a job to do, but I have a job to do too, and uh, that's the way it goes. Well, maybe there's there's other checkpoints. <laughs> maybe we can go around the uh, the north way and get over by the airport, and maybe they'll let us in. A major pyroclastic flow has just gone down, so it's a good time to get in and make some of the more dangerous measurements. What happens is the pyroclastic flows relieve pressure off the dome, and that stops the cracks opening up, so it's a good time to go in and measure the cracks. Juliet Bravo, Sierra One, this is the observatory. Do you copy us? Juliet Bravo, Sierra One, this is the observatory. Come in. Can you repeat that again, observatory? I'm selling, telling you now, hold it. Get ready to move now. Get ready to move. Yes, Sierra One, we are having a signal and it's clipping on all four jumps. Doesn't look good, we'd like you to get out of there immediately. Watch that spot right over there, that's where we're running. There goes the chopper in, unbelievable as it may seem. Where the heck is he going? Somebody in there, there's somebody in there. What? Okay, quiet everybody. What you're seeing here, we think is a rescue operation. There were some people in this area in here where you see the helicopter. And as you can see from where the helicopter is, we've had a major explosion.
That's that's pyroclastic right there. Okay, we gotta get out, David. It's moving this way. Get out. Get, David. It's coming this I way. I know, I know, I know, I know. Okay, Lord. Come on. Put my trust and faith in you. You're my refuge. It's true. Just go. Yeah. <laughs> if I'm quietly obsessed, but I mean, anybody that's begun to uh, photograph them or, or tape them or film them generally wants to do it again. I just appreciate the opportunity to come up here and to video this. It's the last thing I would have expected to be doing in my life, especially uh, in my life as a missionary here in Montserrat, to be up here and uh, be documenting what we're seeing here for generations to come. That is amazing, uh, what's happened up here. Uh, and if you'd have been standing here yesterday morning, you'd have probably <laughs> fainted because a lot of activity took place here. So I can imagine that uh, standing right here, you would have really been a believer in volcanoes. I, it, it's uh, scary, and then again, it's beautiful. And it's, uh, it's an awesome sight to, and, and an awesome experience to stand this close to uh, an active volcano. The way that I understand it, this is just one example of the, uh, the awesome power that created the whole planet. I mean, in a word, it was done. And we still see it ongoing. We're just privileged to be able to stand here and see part of, of a mountain actually being birthed. Over the last uh, 18 months, we've been on a, really an emotional roller coaster. I don't think uh, any governor by choice would uh, choose to uh, babysit a volcano unless they're a masochist. I suppose we've got quite a warm relationship with the volcano now. We've lived with it and we've slept with it for long enough. We, we know it almost intimately. I suppose one analogy is it's like two prize fighters. We've been staring at the mountain. You know, we haven't blinked so far, but you have to respect the mountain. Rather, rather a beautiful dining room when uh, it had been completed, and we've had some uh, some wonderful evenings in here with uh, visiting dignitaries with some of the charity events. And this is the building where Princess Anne spent her honeymoon um, back in 1966-67. This is the year when uh, I will be leaving Montserrat. I will leave with a very heavy heart if the activity is still going at this level. I'm sure the people of Montserrat will feel that if the governor is leaving before it's over, I'm leaving before the job is completed. And I will be saddened by that. But if this is going to be uh, a four or five year crisis, it could be. 
it might be the time to bring in a fresh man, um, a man who isn't tired, a man who brings some fresh ideas. Who knows? I think the volcano will be the master of our destinies at the end of the day. Well, we wanted to come home. My husband cousin had this house for sale, so we bought it, even though we heard the unsafe zone was in operation. It didn't deter us. All our dream was to come home. And by the grace of God, we are here. And we still think we are safe in his hands. The first thing we look for before we retire, we both go and look to see how the mountain is. If he goes before me, he says, come along. We go in the other room and he says, come along. You can see it better there. We married here in Montserrat. 1st of December, December 1954. I went to England and lived here. So we spent over 40 years in England. So we retired and we decided to come back home to spend our last days here. I'd rather stay here than to go in the shelter. Because people go in the shelter and come out of it saying so never go back there. So I will never go into no shelter. Never. I think they think we are mad. When we came here first, people came up and said, we are brave to be here. But we explained to them, we are not really brave. I pray a lot. And I heard a voice saying, have no fear. I keep that voice at the back of my mind. When the fears come along, I do not know who the voice is or where it come from, but I know I heard the voice. Have no fear. I want to declare to you this morning that the God whom we serve is a powerful and mighty God. As we go through these trying times, we must understand that our help does not come from the scientists. They do not know what to expect. They can only propose or suppose what may happen. But God has revealed to us in times of trouble that he will be our stay, he will be our comfort. And he said, though you may be overwhelmed by the trials of life, we are confident of this one thing, that God will take us through. As volcanologists, we can't just stop the volcano. It would be nice to go up to some sort of tap and turn off the tap. And, and, that, and that is what the people of Montserrat really want. We'd love to do it and uh, love to give them what they want, but, but we just can't. We, it's all we can do is, is make sure that no one gets killed, and, and by that is we mean to monitor the volcano and make sure that, that nothing untoward happens. God knows whether it will or will not blow. God knows how far, how devastating the eruption would be. But one thing we are sure of, that God holds us in the palm of his hand. 